And then I'm going to say welcome uh, to the Nonprofits Lead Community Wide Board Training for 2022. And um, I am going to give the floor to Natalie for just a minute, um, let her introduce herself, and also say welcome and hello to everybody. Well, hold on here. <laughs> I forgot to add that there. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the first training. I'm pretty excited that you all are here. Um, and this is this is my first experience getting an event out at the first of the year. So I'm I'm pumped and ready um, for this to happen. Um, but if you have any questions, um, please include those in the chat. Um, Amy said that she will also be giving you opportunities to um, unmute your computer so that you can ask questions verbally if you'd like. So welcome and let's have some fun learning about boards. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. So anyway, you can all follow Natalie's lead if you wish to. Um, you're welcome to leave your cameras on um, or off and you can mute yourself while you are not talking. Uh, just so that we reduce uh, background noise. I will be um, presenting most of this as a PowerPoint. And um, as Ben pointed out earlier, this is also a good time to have lunch during the next couple hours. So we'll take a break whenever it feels right, but please feel free um, to come and go as you need to, as far as making sure that you have um, food and water or take any bathroom breaks that you need to as well. Um, and like Natalie said, um, if you have a question, uh, you're welcome to uh, put it in the chat and Natalie will ask it for you when I ask for questions or you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask it um, when we ask for questions. So I am gonna go ahead and uh, without further ado, share my screen. Okay, can you see the slide? Yes. And you can still hear me. <laughs> yes. All right, so that's wonderful. So again, welcome to uh, community-wide board training. And this is part of the mission of Nonprofits Lead to make sure that we're creating a community of caring and engaged board members um, in the Mid-Ohio Valley. It is part of what builds strong nonprofits, uh, which is our mission to make sure that you build the capacity in the areas that you need. And we know that boards are not only critical to the success of nonprofits, um, but they're, they're sometimes considered a weakness um, in nonprofits. And that's not just a Mid-Ohio Valley thing, that's as a whole. Um, it, can, it can be tough to find good board members who um, have the time to engage and then, and then also to keep them engaged. And so again, that's one of the reasons why we have this training. So I wanna welcome everybody here and that's why we have the training. Uh, in this training, we're gonna talk about what nonprofit boards are supposed to do right? Um, because everybody wants to, um, wants to know what we need to do on our board. Are we all doing the right things? Um, then we want to talk about what is expected of individual board members or the board as a whole. And then a little bit about what are we supposed to talk about at board meetings? Um, and so we're going to go in depth on these areas and make sure that we cover um, all the basics, but it's still the basics. As far as um, techniques and uh, maybe diving deep into running meetings or diving deep into legal responsibilities, those things are going to come in later trainings. Those deep dives are going to be done um, later this year or next month and the month after, et cetera. And Natalie and I will brief you on um, when those trainings are going to happen um, as soon as we can at the end of the training. Um, here we go. Got to make sure that my little button is working. So um, who's in the room? 
could we take just a minute um, to say, uh, unmute and say who we are um, and, and what organization that we're with. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing just for a second so that we have a moment to do so. And you're welcome to come on camera or stay off camera as you like. Alvin, I see that you, you kind of uh, decided to go first. So there, uh, I'm Alvin Phillips. I'm the Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity of the Middle of the Haw Valley. And here with three of our board members, that's so exciting. So, Yay. yeah. Okay, so who are, right. who are Alvin's board members that are here? Me. Me. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Rachel, I think I remember you. You took another uh, a training we had for boards. Um, couple years ago when we did a board development series. Did you not? Yes, yes I did. It great. was great. Great. We also have um, somebody, Amy Cumson, that isn't able to unmute right now. And I totally understand that. Anybody who prefers not to or can't unmute, you can put a little introduction in the chat. Um, and she is the current board president of SPARC, Imagination Science Center in Morgantown, West Virginia. So we welcome Amy, and um, it's it's really fun when we do these Zoom trainings and we're able to get uh, folks from a, a larger um, part of our region. We really appreciate it. Anybody else want to introduce themselves or their organization? Let me back up for sure. just a minute because Rachel introduced herself, but uh, Carolyn Garrity and Shalene Shrewsbury are also board members for Habitat. And we have another staff person here, uh, Ben Bradley. So well, welcome although everybody. I know any, any of them are welcome to introduce themselves. I just wanted to uh, give some shout out to our Habitat board members. Right, it's a little bit of a Habitat party. And I saw Mark Zimmer is on here. Mark, how are you today? I'm good. Sorry about being a few minutes late. Just busy schedule, I guess. I'm Mark Zimmer. I'm uh, the director of Rescue and Restore. We're a human trafficking coalition for Washington County. Well, welcome, Mark. We're glad you're here, and we hope that we can help you get the information you need um, to help your board be stronger. Yeah, and we have another yes, introduction in the you. chat. Jim Rainey, uh, vice president of the Washington County Behavioral Health Board and Nicole Raber, board member for Consumer Counseling Credit Service of the MOV. So what a great crew. Thank you everybody for um, taking the time to introduce yourselves and um, we're really glad you're here. Nice to get connected. I'd like to spend a couple moments to do that just so that um, you can network with each other even though it's a little awkward on Zoom. Uh, you'll remember names and faces maybe a little bit or when you see each other again, hopefully at Nonprofits Lead uh, Annual Conference in May, you'll be able to say, hey, we had board training together and strike up a conversation. It's always a good idea to uh, get to know some more folks from the nonprofit sector in the Middle Ohio Valley and beyond. So we don't have to go through all this because we're not in person and it's too awkward on Zoom to do so. So let's talk about our training outcomes for today. Because this is Zoom and um, I, I know that the majority of you have been on boards um, before or for a while, uh, I'm gonna really think about this more of a, as a conversation than a training. But I, so I wanna encourage you to add where you can add. It doesn't just have to be uh, me doing all the talking. You're welcome to, um, Again, put something in chat or let Natalie know that you have something to share and come off of mute and we can handle that. I will tell you that I can't see anything. I can't even see myself, which is awkward, uh, but I can't see anything other than um, my screen with the setup that I have uh, for technology today. So um, if I seem to be ignoring you, then um, just go ahead and get Natalie's attention through the chat or by raising your hand and she'll help you out. So again, this is board training, not board training. We wanna make sure that you're engaged and uh, getting what you need out of this. And so please engage and ask questions um, anytime you, you want to. 
And also, these are the things that we're going to cover. We're going to talk about boards. We're going to talk about the benefits of the board to the organization and then also to yourself, to being on a board um, and what the building blocks are of a board and some best practices as we go through. The main thing we're going to focus on is the 10 roles and responsibilities of board members. Um, that's what's really going to create the bones for the knowledge and for the systems that you put together in your um, board of directors. We're also going to cover the three legal duties of board members. However, like I said, uh, we're going to have a little bit more in-depth uh, training on legal duties in a future training, which I'll talk about at the end. Also, um, we have a little bit of networking. Like I said, it's kind of awkward on Zoom, um, but please, I want you to feel free to share questions, experiences, ideas, challenges, things you've done that were successful. Um, always feel free to share something good or to ask a question of me or the group or both. Um, so we're gonna skip individual expectations as a come off mute activity because it's a little awkward and it takes a while, but I'd love to have you put anything in the chat that you really wanna get out of today's training. I think it's a good place for you to start even as um, a thought exercise for yourself, um, thinking, what am I really looking for? Why, why is this, why have I chosen to spend the time, spend the money, jump on Zoom? Um, why am I here? So. Uh, take a moment to think about and write down, or if you're willing to share with us, put it in the chat. What do you want to get out of today's training? Tools for acquiring and maintaining engaged board members. That's the secret sauce, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, becoming well-rounded board member. Uh, always great to brush up on previous training. Exactly, exactly. Um, Mark's explaining that he has limited experience. We understand you got to start somewhere, but um, board service is really admirable service to your community. So it's a great thing to do. Um, ben shares that he works for an organization that has a, a board that they answer to, of course, um, and is a board member for a local organization. And so hoping to understand how organizational leaders and boards best work together. Another secret sauce for sure, um, as far as working together. Uh, Nicole wants a refresher on board responsibilities. Jim's saying how to assess and improve board operations and our culture. All great. Oh, great. Alvin's going to cheer on our board members who are attending. Alvin, you're a great cheerleader for all of us, for all of us, for sure. So anyway, I appreciate all of you um, sharing those things. I, I feel like those are all very appropriate um, goals for our session. Um, and also, we're going to talk about, as Ben points out, what is a board decision and what's an internal leadership decision. We have a a section where we talk about, um, about kind of those roles and responsibilities. And, and sometimes those things go back and forth depending on the size or type of the organization, but there are some clear lines. Uh, so great, thank you all. So what is a nonprofit board? Um, you have a series of handouts. You're gonna possibly see on some of the slide a prompt come to look at the handout. You don't have to do that right now, or you can. Um, that's totally up to you, whether you feel like it's distracting to look at another piece of paper or helpful to look at another piece of paper. You've got those, they're yours to keep in PDF form. Um, and so if you'd like to just sit and listen to the sound of my voice and uh, watch the PowerPoint, you're welcome to do so. Um, but you're also welcome to check out each resource as we go through them. 
You'll get a copy or a link to this recording afterward as well and the PowerPoint. And so you'll be able to go back and kind of compare and contrast or access um, the resources along with the PowerPoint at another, um, another point in the future as you wish. And so you know what's right for you as far as learning style. I just wanted to point out that you have those options. So a non perifa board is an organization's governing body. It's required by law in, in order to be a nonprofit um, it sets the mission, the strategy, and the goals of the organization. Those are big things, right? Uh, board members have fiduciary responsibilities to ensure financial accountability for their organization. And again, we're going to go into that um, in more detail, as well as mission, strategy, and goals. But that's the big picture on what a nonprofit board is. It's a heavy lift. So, First of all, I like to talk about the benefits of being a board member because we don't have enough board members. Almost every nonprofit um, executive director or board chair or anybody on the executive committee of a board tells me, how do we get good board members? We're still always looking for board members. And so I like to remind people that there are benefits um, to being on a board. And so if you, uh, again, are so moved, you can type in the chat, what, what do board members get out of being on a board? And what do you get out of being on the board that you're on? What, what are the benefits or advantages um, that you experience? So we've already got some coming in. We've got networking, connection, and leadership skills. I will agree with all of those things. Um, on the networking, you, you end up with like-minded people, right, that you, that you learn, but who are coming sometimes from different professional backgrounds. And so I find like that's some of the most rewarding networking um, to me as well. It, that is that connection, like you point out. Uh, leadership skills, absolutely. Um, all those skills about um, effective communication, delegation, you know, when to lead, when to follow. Those are things that being a good board member definitely, uh, definitely bring you. An opportunity to live out your passion for a mission, absolutely. Um, to kind of put your money where your mouth is, to kind of to engage in and feel good about the work uh, that you care about. Uh, we, another leadership experience, absolutely. Opportunity to hear diverse points of view. That's right. Um, we don't uh, usually end up on the boards uh, sometimes, uh, but don't always end up on the boards of organizations where we're working for people who are experiencing and have experienced all the same things that we have in life. And so we get to um, hopefully end up seeing the world through other people's eyes through our board experience as well. Having a positive impact on our community, uh, teaching others about human trafficking or whatever your mission is, right? Um, in Mark's case, it's human trafficking. Um, engaging the public in your um, in your mission and in the in the cause, right? So engaging the public, educating the public, advocating for people who need to be advocated for, right? These are all benefits of being a board member. And so they're all things that if you had a conversation, um, you know, at church, at work, at a civic organization, you know, anywhere with, with like-minded people um, and talked about what, well, these are the things that I'm gaining from this. You know, it's, it's, a real, um, it's a real PR campaign for being on boards. And so, like I said, we have a deficit of good board members in the Mid Ohio Valley. And so it doesn't hurt to plug uh, the experience that you're having and encourage people, you know, you know, somebody who's smart, who's on the ball, who has a passion and say, are you on a board? You know, not even necessarily your board or the board you're on or your organization, just go be on a board somewhere because I guarantee you're needed, right? And from an internal perspective, remember we have a staff member, 
uh, here today. Boards provide sources of expertise in a variety of fields. That's right. And if you're doing it right, you really do have a nice um, diverse board with a diverse um, leadership skills and diverse experience and, and backgrounds. And so, yeah, that's great. Those are all fantastic. You guys are good at this. Thank you. It's ma it makes my job easier. So uh, what do nonprofit boards do? So the, they, they have 10 major roles and responsibilities and they have three major legal duties. And that again is gonna be the, that's the outline, that's the bones um, of what we're gonna go through um, today. So again, if you will, in the chat, what is it that, you're, that you feel like if you were to sum it up or if you were to um, say what is the most important thing um, that a board does, if some, if you know, again, you're at a, you're at church, you're at a party, and somebody says, you're at a party at church, you know, and, and somebody says to you, well, what, you know, you said, okay, I'm a smart cookie, I'm on the ball, I'm passionate about kids, uh, I should be on a board for some youth organization. Well, what do you mean be on a board? What does a board do? What would you, what would you say? What, what would you say to people um, to, about being on a board? We have an opportunity to provide the community with beneficial experience, um, this person discovered Spark when their children were younger, nothing existed in Morgantown, and so they're providing that ongoing experience, right? So yeah, a lot of times nonprofits are filling a gap. Uh, and so that feeling that we're doing something that needs done in a community that we care about is a great feeling. So yeah, absolutely, providing that ongoing experience providing overall guidance and oversight for the organizational direction, uh, where we are going, what we are doing and why. I love that. Um, and that feels kind of high level governing. And yet I also, I know, cause I heard some of what you were, we were saying earlier, there's also kind of this team member feel um, to what boards do. And so, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, about that kind of governing board versus working board uh, feeling and where those lines are and uh, where they can be. And so, thank you. Any other input on what nonprofit boards do? Chat seems to be working out pretty well. So, I thank you all. I know Zoom isn't always our ideal format, but we're doing pretty well. Hire and evaluate the executive. You're feeling that, aren't you? <laughs> Do you feel evaluated, Alvin? Um, <laughs> yes, yes, that's absolutely, that's one of the top 10 that we're gonna talk about because definitely hire and evaluate the chief executive. And whenever you hire and evaluate somebody, you'll hear me say this again when we get to this section, but you also are supposed to provide them with what they need to do their job. So that's what boards do. Um, there are boards who are working boards with pay, paid staff and boards who are all volunteer organizations. Um, for all volunteer organization, the board is often providing the owner only leadership or the majority of the leadership. Yeah, absolutely. So boards, board roles differ a lot based on the organization and the type of organization, size of organization, size of staff, if any, that kind of thing. You guys are all pretty savvy. So we're gonna unpack those roles and responsibilities um, and listen to your questions, your concerns, your ideas, and any great practices that you have, because I know some of you um, are on boards that have some practices that are worth sharing. So number one, determining the mission and purpose. So interestingly enough, um, for a, a lot of boards miss this. Um, and by miss this, I mean, people come in to an already existing organization to be on the board, to an already existing board. And this mission and purpose is kind of taken for granted. In fact, it may be unstated. It may even be unwritten. I've talked to people who have been on the board of directors of a nonprofit organization and never actually seen the mission statements. 
um, or don't really know the purpose of the organization. They can tell me about programs. They can tell me about fundraisers. They know what the organization does, but they don't necessarily know what its mission is. And so the very first thing that we wanna talk about and probably the number one thing that you wanna get clear um, before you join a board or with a board that you're on, or if you're um, somebody who's onboarding board members is what's the mission um, of the organization? So let's just do um, thumbs up or um, some sort of emoji here. How many of you can like pretty close to word for word say what the mission is of your organization. Do we have a majority? <laughs> so make sure that your mission becomes kind of front and center to, um, to what's happening in the organization. So Alvin says that his is at the top of his board agenda every month. So the agenda for his board meetings, he puts the mission statement at the top um, every month. Um, also, I've heard of boards who have mission moments right? And so they take five or less um, minutes um, out of the, out of the each board mate meeting to talk about something that happened since the last board meeting that really met the mission of the organization. Um, and a lot of organizations have it as part of their, um, part of their orientation to uh, or onboarding, which are not quite the same thing, but when they introduce new board members to the organization, um, it should obviously be on a website. So um, a mission statement is um, what should be guiding the decisions and the purpose and the programs of the organization. And so it really should be clear and well known by everybody in the organization or else it's hard to make decisions or you can't necessarily, it's your litmus test as to when we have a hard decision, is this, is, is answer A or answer B the thing that is gonna, um, gonna meet our mission better, that is gonna fulfill our organization's needs better. Jim says that they review their mission vision and operations during their strategic planning at least every two years, and they put their mission and vision on the back of their meeting agendas, right? So again, trying to keep it in the forefront, um, but you know, I have noticed uh, on a board that I've been on for a few years now that we have somebody in the organization um, on, on the board who's always willing to say, wait, let's compare this to mission. We, you know, like, I feel like that's just her statement she's going to make every time before we make a motion or take a vote is, you know, let's, let's compare it to mission. And that's not a bad role to have of somebody, you know, on the board of directors, or um, it's probably just a good habit to have everybody um, also have, you know, in their heads that how does this compare um, to, to our mission? It's also your most important PR and marketing tool. And as uh, I kind of alluded to earlier, and we're gonna talk about more in depth later, it is the job of a board member to be a public face of the organization. And so, and also it's probably, probably are called on to help make some decisions, even if they're just um, where to direct resources about public relations and about marketing. And so knowing that mission and being able to communicate it and get it out there in effective ways and, and also knowing how well it's known um, amongst your constituents, amongst your staff, amongst your donors, amongst the public or in the community that you're operating in, um, I, that's all very important. So your mission statement 
If you choose to revisit it, which isn't a bad idea with your board of directors, um, should be recognizably yours, right? Make the world a better place isn't necessarily a mission statement, even though you do. Um, it should be memorable. It should be repeatable, so not crazy long. And it should be working for you in the, in the uh, stage uh, that you are in right now as an organization. And just about everybody who is uh, part of this conversation right now knows that Nonprofits Lead uses the nonprofit life cycles model in, as kind of a lens or a tool to look at nonprofits and their natural growth and cycles as, as they develop and as they develop capacity and build. And so the reason why we say working for you or working for you right now is we know things change. Communities change, needs change, technology changes. Um, and as the needs in your community and of your constituents change, it's possible that a mission statement changes. And so that's kind of one of the um, uh, common myths amongst nonprofits is that, you know, this mission statement that might have been written in 1952 is still the best mission statement for us right now um, in 2022. It might not be. And so um, taking a look at it, like Jim shared, uh, on a regular basis, making it part of what you're, you're doing strategically, making it part of your decision making um, is definitely advisable. And as a couple of people shared, you can put it on agendas, you can put it on everything, you can put it on um, the wall, <laughs> right? It can, it can be everywhere. And so make sure that we're talking about boards today, make sure that board members know the mission statement and really um, live it, breathe it, believe in it, are working toward it. You know, one of the things that, one of the questions um, of reasons why somebody was taking um, this training today was because they want engaged, that word engaged board members. And like I said, that's, you know, that's gold, right? Is that engaged board member. The engaged board member is the board member that knows the mission, and, and is connected to that mission. And a lot of times people get on your board because they're already connected to the mission. So you're keeping them connected. Other times you need to make that connection through those mission moments or through um, inviting them in to be part of programs, et cetera, et cetera. So questions about um, mission statements and the and the role of the board when it comes to uh, defining, knowing, creating, and living the mission statement. Number two, Alvin already pointed this one out to us, and this is selecting the chief executive. Now, there might be somebody with us. In fact, I, I know there is at least one organization that's with us today that is an all-volunteer organization as of yet. That's where you are in, in your um, stages of development and growth. And so you might have the temptation to say, this doesn't apply to me. We don't have a chief executive. We don't have any staff. Uh, there's always somebody that is going to be performing those duties of the chief executive. And the, uh, the most effective, efficient board would, would recognize that. Um, and you call it what you want. I would give it a name. And you can, um, if, you, if that's a volunteer position, then okay. Um, but it's still a position um, and it still has requirements and it still needs support. And so I want you to listen, even if, um, even if your organization is all volunteer to this, what we're gonna talk about with the chief executive. So we're gonna fill in the blanks. The blank hires and oversees the lead staff person, the executive director, uh, the CEO, et cetera. 
who thinks that they know what that is? You can throw it in chat. It's hard to be interactive. And the executive committee, very good. Yep. The executive committee, for those of you who may or may not know, um, is typically a committee that is on the board made up of like president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, um, depending on how the bylaws are written. And so, yes, it is the board that hires and oversees um, the lead staff person. Next question, who hires and oversees the management and the other staff? So now the boards that hired, let's say we've got an executive director. Um, now who's gonna hire and oversee management and other staff? The executive director, exactly, exactly. So what we're getting at here um, is that there are clear roles and responsibilities between the board. And if you have a, a chief executive or you put somebody in charge um, of the organization, like an executive director or president. Um, we usually don't use the word president in nonprofits um, because that sometimes gets um, cloudy with president of, of the board or board chair. So the, the board hires and selects and hires and supports the executive director, CEO, and then that person is hiring and overseeing the management of the other staff. Um, anybody want to take a stab at the day-to-day -day operations and the volunteers? Who's in charge of that? The ED. Says a good ED, right? <laughs> Who knows her, her uh, respond, roles and responsibilities? That's right. And so the reason that we bring this up um, is because this is a really important role um, of the board. The board should understand a lot about the organization in order to know what kind of CEO, what kind of chief executive, what kind of executive director is the right person um, for the job at the right time. And um, so it's important that Jim, Jim brings up that it should be recommended um, by the executive committee to the full board and that um, the, the chief executive is then also in line with what the board is seeing in the organization at the time, but also the direction um, that the board wants to go with the organization. Too many times boards are passive about the chief executive when it, and they're just they're just waiting to hear. That's not an engaged board, right? What what a true the CEO executive director wants is a partnership, where we're forging direction together, we're evaluating together. They want evaluated. They want evaluation of the organization. I know we've got a couple. Um, executive directors on here that would agree with me. They like that engagement um, and, and they want, they feel like stronger executive directors when they have that um, full engagement from their board. Which leads us right into number three, which is support and evaluate that um, chief executive. So we want to help them set the annual goals for their staff person and ensure that they have professional development opportunities as needed, the resources and the tools um, that are needed to succeed, to do their job, and they have assistance from the board, from other staff, from volunteers, uh, that they're evaluated at least annually, um, and that they know what to, that the board know, or the whoever does the evaluation, it doesn't have to be the entire board, it can be a subset of the board, a committee, on the board like the executive committee, um, but that they know what to evaluate that lead staff person on. And I know, again, we've got really great executive directors on this call. Uh, I know that I would have heads nodding if we were in the room because, um, because a good executive director wants to be evaluated, wants that feedback loop, wants um, 
also this communication about this is what you want, this is what I need, um, these are our goals that we've developed um, together, they meet our mission, uh, that, that real engaged partnership. Um, and so again, back to how do, board, how do I be a good board member, right, which is why I'm here, or how do boards be more engaged? Um, here are some bullet points right here to take back to your board or for yourself to say, are we setting these goals? Are we, are we actually asking the question, do you have everything you need to do your job? What assistance do you need from us or can we reach out and get for you? And, and again, evaluating that person, come up with what the basis of evaluation is gonna be and um, coming up with that uh, annual evaluation. Uh, Are there questions about two or two and or three supporting or evaluating? Anything in the chat, Natalie? I didn't see anything. They're pretty good. Oh, we got uh, somebody that needs muted. Here we go. Gotcha. <laughs> no worries. All right, any questions about uh, selecting or evaluating the chief executive? Let's show one more slide here with the core competencies of a chief executive. And so if your board is at the point where you don't know what to use um, to evaluate, this is a good uh, beginning basis. These are broad categories, um, but a good chief executive or good executive director is gonna be able to tell you what their goals are probably in each one of those categories, like as a subset of the category. And you have this handout in your PDFs. Um, so depending on the side, these next things that you see along the side here, depending on the size of the organization, um, that's going to depend on how you're able to, um, handle the chief executive and their duties, but the core competencies are still planning, fundraising, administration in the organization, board relations, communication and public relations, and financial management. Questions about those? Okay, so number four of our 10 roles and responsibilities is to ensure effective planning. So, what planning activities does your board do? Hopefully your board does many. Again, the, the downside of planning is the board that doesn't plan. And I've seen them. Um, the board that sits back and waits for the executive director to bring them the plans and that just kind of rubber stamps or yes man's um, what those plans are. That's not an engaged board. That's not what we want. We want boards who are asking questions, are um, helping with the planning that in fact have a planning cycle that um, happens regularly, okay? And these are questions that you can take back to your board and say, what if you don't know, you can say, what are our planning activities? What, what plans do we have or what plans do we make? Um, are we planning regularly? Do we just say, oh, as needed, we'll do planning when it's needed, you know, if there's an event. Um, who's involved and what the different kinds of planning are? And then do we follow up? How do we check against our planning? Um, how do we know that when we make a plan, it's used or it's followed? Um, so Alvin says that he's found that planning in the time of COVID has been lacking, correct. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the majority of what I have heard from people is there was there, first there was this kind of standstill, but there's still this sort of wait. Um, there's, still, there's still kind of a lot of, um, I, 
a lot of unknown factors, I guess, um, and a lot more canceling uh, of plans, correct? Um, a lot more, um, well, we can't do this, so we're gonna wait and see that type uh, feel. <clears throat> so maybe this is a time, if, if a board is feeling like we can't do the planning that we would normally do, uh, which would be an engaged board that was feeling that way, then <clears throat> maybe the time <clears throat> now is to ask the board <clears throat> to engage in other ways. So maybe it's assessment instead of planning. So instead of, I know uh, if, I, if I may, I know Shalene has done this with her organization um, to, to say, all right, you know, we're going through some stuff right now and it's hard to plan. So let's figure out where we are. You know, let's take a look internally um, at the present moment instead of necessarily externally or at the future. Let's take a look internally at the present moment and do assessment. And what's interesting is I believe that assessment is as ongoing as planning because it's a necessary precursor to planning. However, what you don't see it here in these 10 roles and responsibilities, you don't read about it a lot in um, board source or other um, blogs or literature about board roles and responsibilities. Uh, I don't know if that's because it's taken for granted as part of planning, or it's just something that really hasn't gotten tapped into. But like I said earlier, we use the life cycles um, model. And the very first thing we do in life cycles is we figure out where we are. Um, so we know what to look at. What do we even need to plan for, right? If we don't know where we are, we don't know what to plan next because we're not sure what's, what's coming next. And so um, knowing, doing an assessment and then saying, okay, now based on this assessment, we're gonna do some planning. I feel like it came naturally um, with the organizations that I've worked with. Anytime we did an assessment, whether I was part of that organization or acting as a consultant to that organization, anytime we did an assessment, we immediately, like just naturally bubbled up things that we needed to plan for, things that we needed to improve um, or do or watch for for the future. So take the take this add assessment to it and then take that back to your board as a, as a good way to engage. And you know, there are people, um, depending on their Myers-Briggs or, or other personality type, who love planning, who just love to plan. They, they have that future orientation. Um, and so, you know, again, tapping into what the way to engage board members is to tap into what they love to get to their why and, and why are they there, right? We talked about mission. Um, and so but what's their connection, their personal connection to that mission? And then what is it that they love to do? Um, and one of the best pieces of advice ever is not only just to tap into what they love to do, but to actually ask them what that is, not to assume. Um, and the example is don't assume just because somebody's an accountant that they want to be your treasurer. They might want to be the person who sources the chocolate <laughs> for the big event or something like that. That might be um, rewarding to them. And so uh, be sure to ask what your fellow board members want to do to engage. And then if you're a staff person, uh, you know, engage your board members in conversations about what what thrills them about, you know, what skills do they don't get to use in their regular life that they might get to use by being on your board? Um, what connections do they have that they wanna tap into, that kind of thing. Um, and that'll help with the planning as well. So uh, number four, ensuring effective planning. Are there questions or any input? Anyone wanna uh, share good, um, practices that they've used or any input or wishes or questions, anything at all um, about planning your board. This is a lot to chat, so I'll just um, say it. Uh, Hi, Shaleen. I, 
Hi. I absolutely love planning. I think that is something that I get excited about. I think in my personal life and professional life, it's something I've just realized. I just feel calm when I'm planning. And I feel like, you know, when there's um, a plan to move forward, it just, I don't know, it takes some of the stress away of all that you have to do <laughs> in the planning process. Um, but what, what's really helped for us here at Consumer Credit is I'm evaluated based off of goals that I set with the board's input each year. Um, and then the accomplishment of those goals align with, or I should say those goals and the accomplishment of them align with our strategic plan. So it's, it's like, it starts with that strategic plan. My goals each year are based off of that, you know, in the step-by-step -step process of here's when we think we might have this goal accomplished. Um, and then, and I'm reflecting on this because I just had to complete my last year's accomplishments. What, what did we do? What didn't we do? Where are we now? What do we still need to accomplish for 2022? And it has, it's really, and we just had our strategic planning meeting at the end of last year. So we're setting new ones on top of the old. And it's just a really neat ongoing um, flow to the process that we almost, I mean, we obviously have to think about it, but because it's a system we've created, it just flows. It flows for me as the leader of my organization and it flows for uh, the board as the governing guiding body of our organization. So just wanted to throw that out there because it's, um, it's really worked for us and that is how I'm evaluated. That's where my possible raise or um, bonus comes from. That's you know how um, they can see what I'm doing, what I'm not doing, or what as an organization we need to work on, what they need to support me with further. Uh, to reach those goals or to find out why are we not reaching that goal. That's great. And that gives them an avenue of engagement too, right? Because that, that's a little bit of a digging in, right? Because because those are deeper than just the strategic goals, than the personal goals and, and what you're doing to accomplish them. That lets them have a bigger window into the organization's day-to-day -day operations. Sometimes my only... <laughs> My only thing that I think the board gets overwhelmed with is I'm a little too detailed <laughs> and I want the steps of the process and, and they're like, you know, Shalene, just, just show us the goal and, you know, that's all we need. So I'm learning to not be so detailed, keep those details for myself and maybe for our staff or our team here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm still learning, you know, the ways to simplify that, but I, I love it. It's, it's literally what, as you said, sets me on fire and um, makes me feel accomplished too and helps me reflect, oh gosh, we did not meet that this year. So we really need to focus on it for next year or is it a relevant goal? Right. And that can be evaluated too by the board. Thank you, Shaleen. That, that's all, yes, absolutely perfect. Um, and you know, that's, I, I think what she said about the details, that, that's going to vary person to person, right? There will be board members who might like to dig down into those details um, and, and want to share those with you, but others who won't. Uh, and so that's, that's a good question to ask or a thing to know um, about the different uh, board members. And as a board member, though, let me, let me flip it around the other way. Um, and that is, it's, it's a slippery slope how you handle it, though, because you, if you're a detailed person, make sure you have the relationship and rapport with the executive director when you're asking for details, because you want to make sure that it doesn't seem like you're up in their business. Remember, the day-to-day -day operations are, are the responsibility of the chief executive, as well as the staff and, and, and volunteer management. And so, um, you know, one of the things, just like assessment, that isn't in our top 10, but is on Amy's list would be, is relationship management. And um, we had, uh, I think a couple of years ago, Nonprofits Lead had a, a board president, executive director retreat because we wanted to bolster those relationships and the communication in those relationships. 
And it was one of the most fun programs I think we ever did uh, because it is such an important relationship. And all of you board members, I want to, and staff members and executive directors, I want to encourage you to have relationships with each other. Um, I know that's harder on Zoom. And if your board meetings are on Zoom, you probably have great atten higher attendance, lower rapport. Um, but but make sure that you get to know each other and have enough rapport and are able to express what you care about in a way um, that, that you're having camaraderie type conversations about the mission, about the programs, about the goals, about the details um, or steps to achieve the goals in a way that, that again, feels comfortable to the staff, because remember, they are the professionals. They're the day-to-day -day people that are living and breathing it. You're getting a 35,000 foot view um, and, and less, unless you all choose to share otherwise. And the next slide really um, goes, basically, Shaleen could have just written it for me, um, which is make it just part of your process to um, have a planning cycle, build it into your year, um, say, where do we wanna go? You know, where are we now? That's the assessment. Um, what's missing? What do we need to do, right? That's when we start to come up with our strategic goals. Who will do it? Um, how are we gonna measure it? That's how we're gonna go back and reflect on what we do and making sure that that those questions get asked of all these different parts of the organization. Um, and just like Shalene alluded to, then she can have goals in each of those areas. And then if you choose to do so, you can make that the evaluation conversation um, for the chief executive. And then the chief executive, if they choose to do so, they can make those the evaluation conversations with the staff. Um, and you can evaluate volunteers. Um, again, not necessarily on anybody's top 10 list, um, but volunteer management is, um, it's a course in itself, right? It's definitely a course in itself. And we find that the more relational and yet professional um, that whoever is doing your volunteer coordination and management is, um, it, the, the better the engagement. Um, and commitment of volunteers. Other questions or comments on uh, planning? I just heard the clock bing <laughs> and it made me think, uh, that it might be a good time to take a quick bio break. And so I just think I'll let everybody, including myself, have five minutes to stretch our legs, stretch our necks, um, whatever you need to do. If it's, if it's lunchtime for you, go ahead and grab yourself something to eat. Uh, grab, make sure you have water or whatever you need close by. And um, I will see you at five after 12. You gotta love Zoom. So questions from our first half of the, from our, our morning half of the program or conversation. Any questions bubble up while you were on break? Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. So we had just finished up talking about um, the roles and, and responsibilities of board members for um, planning. And we have a question about the ideal size for a board or the number of members. And, and that is, 
That is an interesting question, and it, and it comes up a lot, and, and it varies. The answer to the question varies depending on the size um, of the organization and how they're using board members. And so I don't have any way um, without, without knowing an organization what would be their ideal size. Um, I will tell you that organizations that are startups who only have like three board members, it's not big enough. Um, and I can tell you that organizations that um, like to give people a board title uh, for signing a check and end up with 25 board members, it's usually too big. And there wasn't necessarily do that, it could have done something else. Uh, and so to be specific, more than three and less than 25. <laughs> um, and I, I say that jokingly, but seriously. Um, beyond that, I think you've got to, you know, you've got to look at would seven or nine be okay for some organizations? Yes. Um, and is is 15 or 20 too many for some organizations? No. And so um, you know, there are organizations that need a lot of, of working board members. Um, or their organizations need to be more agile. Um, and so the, the answer is what's in our bylaws? What do our bylaws say about number of board members? Let's make sure that matches our needs. And then when we assess our needs, we should look at our stage, our life cycle stage, um, and what are our needs based on that stage? So how much activity do we expect out of our board members? How much um, time are they giving in addition to the board meeting itself? And how many committees do we need? Committees that you need would be based on two things, whether they're working, whether you're a working board or a governing board or some combination thereof. Um, and then whether, you know, as Shaleen talked about the strategic goals and the and what's happening to meet those goals, whether a lot of times a board will line up committees on the board to match some of the goals that the board is working toward. Um, and that can be whether or not there is a, a staff working toward them as well. And so that's my, my answer, not answer, to what size should a board be. It's, it's uh, sort of the answer to many questions comes to the, get you the answer to that one. Okay, so um, 10 roles and responsibilities again, back to number five, which is to monitor and uh, strengthen the programs and or services of the organization. And the words monitor and strengthen are um, in all capitals because it doesn't necessarily say run or perform or invent, create, come up with new ones. Um, because in, again, in some organizations, that is the role of the staff. Uh, but a good board should know what programs there are, right? That's part of monitoring is, you know, at least I've got a list. I know what programs our organization has to meet this mission, know how they're connected to um, the mission, and then know how they're performing. Um, so what do they need or how did they fit into where we, you know, our community needs assessment or where we're going as an organization. And so um, a good board member, an engaged board member, right, which is what we're looking for, um, can talk about the programs of the organization and can tell me, if I were to ask anybody, um, again, at, at uh, any, any social event, uh, what our programs are, how those meet our mission. And then in the board meeting, there's probably some key indicators about programs that we're looking for. And this is where um, really, uh, really, less mature maybe in this area boards, they could have been around for a long time, but they might be less mature in this area. Boards are looking at numbers, just flat out numbers. How many people participated in X, right? In X program. So how many did we give blank to, 
Okay, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Those numbers um, are necessary because we we want to take a look at growth. We want to see um, where resources are being spent versus the impact we're having. But what we really want to look at is the impact we're having. And so um, really good dug in moving forward organizations and boards are monitoring programs um, based on impact. And so they're saying, what's What's the real return on investment, right? You've heard of the term social return on investment. Let's introduce that to our boards. What is the real social return on investment that we're getting by having this program, right? Okay, so 10 people came to the event to the, the, and got the things that we were giving out. Great, they got the information or they did the things. But what impact did that have? Can we, can we go then in six months and talk to them about what they did with it, how it changed their lives, whether, whether there was a difference, right? So it's the difference between Habitat, since you are the majority of the room, let's, let's use you as an example. It's the difference between saying, we built three houses this year, banner year, versus these, these children now have this permanent home structure. And what we know from having a, a safe, healthy place to live is that it also affects their outcomes in all these other areas. And so Habitat um, for Humanity is actually an organization that has a lot of social um, return on investment or social impact data. And they can talk about the, the real impact on the economy, on the community, and um, on the lives uh, and long-term lives of the people that they're uh, of the people that they're serving, and so as a board member, if you want to really be engaged and again and that and have that why and connect to that mission, what you what you want to do is say what is the impact that we're having through these programs and services? Not just I give away X, um, and I gave away 150 of them this year, but but I, by giving that away, then am creating this change in someone's life or in society or in our community, et cetera. And so um, again, if you're on a board or leading a board through these roles and responsibilities, and you feel like you know, this is the area that you wanna strengthen or get engaged on, then really looking at impact um, versus raw um, numbers of people served might be a good next step. And then we say strengthen um, programs or services because board members can strengthen programs and services in lots and lots of different ways. One is just by offering their time for those as well and getting involved, but also, you know, talent, uh, we treasure connections to other people, um, analysis of data. There's a lot of different ways that a board member um, can monitor and strengthen a program or service. And Alvin says that also takes a lot of intentional effort. Um, focusing on numbers is easier, right, right. And that's why, I mean, I use the word less mature, but what I meant is probably lower capacity. An organization that might just be starting out or might still, might for some reason be in a low capacity place when you do an assessment of them, might just be counting numbers of houses built. And I say just, <laughs> um, but an organization that might be a little more mature or further along in our life cycle in this area um, would, would have gone that extra capacity building step to understand what that means impact wise on people's lives or on the community as a whole. So yes, thank you, Alvin. That, yeah, what I was referring to certainly wasn't um, an easy or simple task. Um, so true or false, um, and, and we can put these in the chat, staff and volunteers run the day-to-day -day operations. I think we kind of covered that one. Oh, Alvin says, and those are the stories we use for appeals, right? So um, all these 10 roles and responsibilities are connected, but so you've got that mission and then you connect it through uh, these programs and services um, and then start to have that impact. And now when we start to talk about financial responsibility and financial solvency in the organization, knowing 
those impacts and being able to use those impacts to tell the story to gain more supporters of the organization. That's okay, that's the secret sauce. <laughs> Thank you, Albert. Okay, so uh, who's responsible for um, the day-to-day -day operations? Is that, is that true or false that it's the staff um, and volunteers? True. Right. Board oversees a lead staff person and may help with volunteers. Their job is to look toward the future. True or false? Good job. Uh, when a board member helps with day-to-day -day operations, they do so as a volunteer. Let me see some answers to this one. True. Does anybody want to come off mute and explain what we mean by when a board member helps with day-to-day -day operations, they do so as a volunteer? I'm happy to do. <laughs> so this is a little bit of a put, putting, reminding people of uh, their place in the organization. And so there's this awkward, and I think we've got the quote on here later, there's this awkward thing where, you know, board members are volunteers, right? Your board members are not, um, for, the, for the large majority, are not paid um, to be on the board of directors. And um, so they are volunteers, and yet they have like some oversight types of responsibilities. And so um, it is important, important that, as Jim puts it, individual board members have no authority um, unless and until they participate in a full board meeting and vote, okay? And that they are the board members, unless, just because you're a board member does not mean you're over any staff or over um, any volunteers. And so it's a, um, it's a thing that we, we put in here and we ask board members to be sensitive to because you can, you can feel like you're the boss. And when you go into the organization, they can feel like you're the boss. Um, but when you're in there stuffing envelopes for the annual appeal or um, helping set up for a fundraising event, you're a volunteer. You're not in charge. It's not time to change things. It's not time to second guess um, the way the executive director is doing things. Um, it's very important that uh, board members, especially those who have um, staff or a strong volunteer corps remember when they are um, in charge and when they are not in charge, and, and that they're sensitive to the fact um, that others, others may be sensitive to that fact. Um, and so uh, we just like to point that out here at this point in the training so that it falls on the ears it needs to fall on. Um, and that also for those of you who may experience a situation where a board member comes in and wants to judge the spaghetti sauce at the event or whatever the minute detail is that they're not responsible for. You know, you can say, hey, I took this training, Amy Elliott says you're not responsible for that. <laughs> um, and then you can, you know, throw me under the bus. Um, so board members, remember when you're a volunteer that you are a volunteer and, um, and everybody else can handle it, um, can handle it kindly. So my board is a working board. What is a working board? Does anybody want to kind of venture a guess or a definition of a working board?
So working boards typically, uh, you see them in all volunteer organizations a lot of times. Um, but uh, let's look at some of the rules and responsibilities of governing um, versus supporting. Uh, so working boards often get involved in more in the daily um, activities of an organization, but again, they're still uh, volunteers when they're in that capacity. So two types of board responsibility, there's governance and there's support. So governance is I am being a board member right now, okay? I'm acting as a representative um, to the public and governing the organization's affairs, okay? That's the hat. Um, that, you know, that's what goes on that hat of governance. Support then is um, I'm volunteering for this organization. And again, the reason we even have this slide and we have this conversation is there can be confusion about it. So uh, much confusion about board responsibilities is confusion between what the board should do as a group versus what an individual board member should do. And in fact, when uh, there was registration for this um, series, there was a question put versus what are the responsibilities of individual board members or what is the power of the board? Um, so it really is a very astute question. So the answer is that board members have to learn to switch roles as appropriate. So Remembering that, and this is the this is the cute quote: Board members are part-time amateurs that are overseeing the work of full-time professionals, and therefore always have to be sensitive to that. So when I'm governing the organization, I'm representing the community's interests within the organization, and I'm acting as part of a larger body. Okay, we are the board, and so that's where we get into: we will determine the mission and purpose. We will ensure compliance with federal, state, and local regulations. We will safeguard the assets of this organization. You see, it's that level um, of governance. We're gonna determine strategies and priorities, ensure a realistic budget, right? We do this together, that's our governance. But the board and the, especially the individual board members act to support the organization. And so this is where you're, you are representing the organization's interests to the community. So now I'm acting as an individual or through a committee. So maybe I'm writing a check to the organization. Um, maybe I'm asking uh, for donations of my friends as an individual, okay? Not overseeing the financial responsibility, but you can see how they dovetail. Um, I might... Um, recruit volunteers as an individual. I might go out, you know, and, and talk at all those social events that Amy's been talking about. Um, I like lend my name or my personal accountability or credibility to the organization. So I think all good board members should have some sort of name tag or shirt or hat or something uh, that identifies them as an important part of the nonprofit that they work with. So questions about the two types of roles or the two types of responsibility, um, the governance piece versus the support piece. You're getting this slide. Also, everything on here is completely legitimate to expect of board members. And so this slide is good for that reason too, because it's pretty cool um, as far as, as uh, discussing engagement um, when you have a board that is ready, willing, or able to discuss their engagement as a board and the things that they're doing in their meetings and their um, planning cycle that we talked about earlier versus their engagement as individuals and the things that they're willing to do as individuals um, to engage and support the organization. 
Amy, it seems kind of like there's a there would be a delicate balance here between so if if the board is perhaps not aware of some of these responsibilities or is maybe not really fulfilling the responsibilities, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, how you know executive directors or the the full-time professionals in these organizations, help communicate some of these responsibilities to board members to make sure that they are engaged and understand their responsibilities because uh, they're kind of speaking to those who are also governing the organization as well. Right, absolutely. It's, it's the slipperiest slope um, on earth and it can, really can be for an executive director or any staff person. Um, so it's a great question. I think that my first piece of advice is always throw Amy under the bus. Um, just, you know, in other words, blame professional development. <laughs> it's, it's a good reason to, it's a good way to answer the question, why are you bringing this up now? Which is really the question. Um, and, and the question, the, the, the hard answer to that question is because you're not doing what you're supposed to do as a board. The easier answer to that question is because I just took this training or I just saw this handout um, or Amy said, our nonprofits lead tells us to. Um, and so, you know, that is a, hopefully a conversation starter that would then um, make it less personal and make it less of a slippery slope then because then there's no finger pointing. Then we're all on the same team. Instead of I'm looking at you, we're both looking at this piece of paper and we're saying, oh, approve a fundraising strategy. <laughs> we never did that. Oh my gosh, we just set we strategy. We just have a spaghetti dinner. What are you talking about strategy? And so, you know, if we if we look at the resources that you get in in a training like this, um, you know, on the same side of the table, side by side uh, with somebody, I think that's the best way to start conversations about what are we going to do next? Because there's always a place to build capacity. The best organization in the whole wide world could look at this piece of paper and probably pick out something that they aren't doing or that they can improve upon. And so um, that's how I would start the conversation. Other questions? And remember, I welcome, um, you know, like Shalene did, the things that are working for you um, or any, any other types of input or advice as we go along. Number six in our 10 rules and responsibilities is to ensure adequate financial resources. And um, this comes in lots of different forms, but this it, the way this is written is the, what is the responsibility. It is ensure adequate financial resources. So that doesn't say donate, that would be an individual policy in, in a nonprofit. Um, and there is a lot of back and forth about board members and, and donations. And um, it, I feel like it would almost take too much time. A lot of foundations, however, want to see that board members are donating. However, from an equity point of view, and the fact that we want a wide variety of backgrounds, including socioeconomic on our boards, we need to make sure that those donations are they are at the level that is comfortable for the individual board member and that we accept that. Um, and so what I'll say to board members and to executives is that it's just important that the board, and I'm not just saying the treasurer, don't say I'm not a numbers person, we have a treasurer for that. The board knows what are our sources of income, what are we spending money on? How do those match up? And how do we compare to our goals? If every single board member could answer those four questions, then you could say you were really coming along nicely toward making sure that your board was ensuring adequate financial resources. Um, one thing that I have seen Two, two things that I've seen that are no-nos. 
Number one is an executive director that is just feeding like, bing, here's, here's a slide or here's a piece of paper, we're good. And the board goes, okay, great. And that's the treasurer's report or the financial report at the board meeting. Um, you're, got, you're gonna need to see a little more um, data than, than you need to see the source of data. Um, and, you need, and you need to see more data than just we're okay. Um, and the other thing that I've seen before is a treasurer who puts out a lot of data, but it isn't legible to the average Joe. And that's unexcusable too, because anybody worth their salt, I mean, anybody that, that's working with the numbers could put it in some format that's easy for people to understand. And I just joined a new board um, a couple months ago and I had my first uh, all graph financial report that I had ever seen. And I was, at first I was like, wait a second, this isn't gonna be good enough. And then there were like, like little key codes about what the coloring meant and you know, this versus goal and this versus last year. And, and darn it, if I don't think they, that that treasurer managed to pull it off. And so, um, you know, this is another way as you're talking to your board about, about what you learned today or as you're looking into assessing where you are or how to engage better. I think one way that board members get disengaged is they, they think that somebody else is in charge of the finances or the numbers and they're not a numbers person. I've heard that so many times, it makes me crazy. Um, and so, you know, please ask your board members to just understand, to just be able to answer those four questions. How do we get money? How do we spend money? How did the two match up? And where are we compared to our goals? Um, those would be the, the minimum that I would expect any, any board member, um, any board member to know. Any questions or uh, comments, input? on number six. This form on this slide is just one example of what could be 100,000 examples of um, a, way that, a way that a report could look. Number seven, also financial related, is protecting assets and providing financial oversight. And so um, this requires the, the last one, you know, there was just a little four key questions and, and kind of a knowing or understanding. This one is a little bit more um, strategic input. And this is one of the reasons why um, we like to have, we do like to have numbers people on our board. So when we take a look at um, what are the, what are the, what's the level of diversity or what are the skills that are represented by people that are on our boards? We do wanna make sure that we have some people that um, understand and uh, are good with numbers. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> so uh, the board should set an annual budget with the lead staff person, right? Working together, um, consistently reviewing financial reports at each meeting. Um, setting and ensuring cash flow policies and making sure there are double checks on those policies. Um, we have a, a friend in the Attorney General's Office of the State of Ohio in the Charitable Law Division, and, and we've, we've had programs with her before where she talks about all the different ways that nonprofits have just trusted people and just um, not defended themselves with the right number of double checks um, on, on cash flow, et cetera. So making, making sure that, um, making sure that you set up a system so that no person is responsible. So see, we say monitoring the CEO's use of funds. That's nothing against the CEO. Um, the executive directors that are, that are here right now are, you know, the two of the most outstanding people I know in the world. And yet I guarantee you part of that is they want their use of funds monitored. They like oversight because it covers their bottoms as well. 
And so if you think of it not as a personal thing, like, oh, I trust or so-and-so would never, um, or and if it, it's not personal, it's a system and it is a responsibility, then that's the right mindset to be in um, for uh, protecting assets and providing financial oversight. Um, I have even been part of an organization where we found out that the treasurer just signed a bunch of checks and left town so that uh, while she was gone, um, anybody who needed to could, uh, you know, buy what they needed to. Not really a best practice. Alvin says, and Alvin, for those of you who may not know, I think almost everybody in the world knows Alvin, <laughs> um, that he loves getting questions about financials from the board, right? Um, we, we who are doing what we're supposed to be doing or in a good team, you know, management spirit do like to, to talk about it and do like to, to get questions about what's happening so that we can, um, double check ourselves and, and, and use others, uh, resources and knowledge and good ideas. Um, ensuring and reviewing audits and if your organization is not big enough that you have to have official um, audits done, you can do internal audits. Um, getting the same question month after month and from the same person is a different story. Right. So, <laughs> so if you're a board member and you're a one question pony, <laughs> you probably want to figure out how to get that information yourself or why you think you need um, to ask it repeatedly. Uh, Shalene says, I love how Alvin suggested a side meeting to help us as board members to better understand um, the financials. Right, um, remember we referred to onboarding earlier and you know when you bring a board member on, it's your responsibility to, as the rest of the board, um, or as the board development committee, or as the board president or executive committee, depending on whose lap you put it in, um, to make sure that the board member can be a good board member. Uh, and part of that is saying, this is how we present financials, um, and this is what we expect as far as review of them. Making sure that you're so every board member should know that your organization has submitted the forms that it needs to submit to the IRS. And you would um, be very surprised at how uh, infrequently board members know that. It's not about trusting people. It's about knowing that there's a, there's a system, that there are requirements in place, that we have a system to meeting, meet them, and we just need to check on it. Okay. So questions or comments further about protecting assets and providing financial oversight. So again, when we're looking for engaged board members, one of the questions you can ask if you're a board member is going back to your board and saying, how do we, and pick one of these check marks, or when do we, and pick one of these check marks. Um, how are we engaged in this piece? So the board's responsibility, one of the board's responsibilities is also to build a competent board. And this is also one of those that gets often put onto an executive director uh, to find us new board members or um, just, you know, is more random and less methodical and planned out and intentional than it should be. And so um, let's talk about building a competent board. Board members should have some sort of why, internal why, internal connection or passion uh, for the cause or the mission. So it's something they've experienced themselves, they've been connected to, they care deeply about, they see is in their community, some sort of, some sort of connection to it. Uh, they should also have some sort of skill, resource, expertise, 
something that is valuable to the nonprofit. And I, as we talk about um, board diversity, which this would be the, the bullet point under which we should talk about board diversity, I will just say that nobody should ever tick just one box, okay? So we don't bring somebody on just because they're an accountant or just because they're a person of color or just because they have XYZ life experience or just because they're a woman or a man or whatever. Everybody, everybody, I guarantee you, prove, I try to prove me wrong has something else to offer than one thing. Um, and so always um, make sure that when we talk about what do we need to develop, to build out this board um, and in your handouts, you got an Excel um, board matrix. That's just an example, just a start. It's one I made up to help um, teach students about board diversity and board composition. Um, but when you have that conversation to know that, okay, person Amy probably had, well, you know, she has this, this, uh, these resources, she has this talent, she has the, the, this background, she has these connections, you know, acknowledge somebody, let them tick off uh, lots and lots of boxes, and then look for, you know, what do we need? And again, it all, it all melds together, you know, like Shalene said earlier about, you know, we start with our strategic plan, um, which could actually start with a assessment of the organization and or community. And then we go into um, individual goals and then we can, you know, then we go into the goals for the organization and the individual um, goals. And so now we can talk about, well, then what are the, what do we need on our board to do those kind of things too? So if we have a mission and a vision, what do we need the team to look like? So a good, a good engaged board is a board that would feel like a team and everybody would feel like they had um, a piece of the puzzle that was needed. They should have a basic uh, understanding of legal requirements associated with a nonprofit. It doesn't need to be beyond, um, beyond this couple hours introduction. And they should have the capacity to serve. One of the problems that we have in it, and it's actually been um, proven through research uh, in the Mid Ohio Valley, is that we have um, we have an aging board population. We have a lack of diversity in our board population, and um, we have people that are on most of the our board members are on like three boards, uh, if I remember the data correctly. And so we want to make sure that we are getting people that truly have the capacity to engage in the organization um, and give their time, talent, and treasure to it. And so you've got lots of follow-up documents uh, to this one because really this could be um, this could be a conversation in itself. But uh, there's a key questions to ask of people who want to be on your board, and and we've already given you key questions to ask if you want to be on a board. Um, and then there is the board orientation and board responsibilities and structures about how you need, if you need committees, term limits, uh, et cetera, so that you can recruit the board members that you need, onboard them, and then keep them engaged as you need to do so. So questions or comments from anybody about building a competent board. Like I said, I feel like we could have a, we could, we could have an hour or two to ourselves <laughs> on this one, um, just, just on building the board and, and on um, recruiting and training. But uh, are there any specific questions, comments, best practices? Anybody have any input on this one? I have found it incredibly uh, helpful when you have a well-rounded board of professionals in their area. You know, it's great to have an accountant or an attorney or a banker or an HR professional because so often in nonprofit organizations, 
you know, particularly smaller organizations, you don't have those people on staff. So to have that expertise available to you on your board of directors is so wonderful uh, an asset to have. Yeah, thank you, Ben. That's, that's a great question to ask. As, as you're determining what are the skills that we need on our board, what do we need that we don't have, right? Again, looking at the, the whole organization as a team. And also kind of managing board members rather than taking them for granted, um, focusing on retaining them by appreciating and involving them, making sure that they were oriented uh, well when they came on the board and um, that recruiting is done in, a, in an intentional way, I think is the best thing to say. You all have this slide, um, really the, the idea is just that um, retention will come through these other steps and making sure that these things are done on, on an intentional level, right? Even if it's by somebody else that's, that's on the board. And we say we at Habitat have a fairly large board, but when I look around at our meetings, every Everyone has a key role and is able to bring insight. We get that from Rachel. So thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, I know Alvin has been very intentional um, about helping that board, um, helping build out that board and building that competent board. Okay, so number nine uh, is ensure legal and ethical integrity. And um, there are three legal duties of board members and they are summed up as care, loyalty, and obedience. And so this, is a, this would be a great thing to uh, remind your board of. And that is care is paying attention to the organization's activities and operations in what would be considered a reasonable amount, right? So earlier when we talked about finances, I said, um, we wanted to make sure that you, the people didn't just push the treasurer's report, report aside and say, I'm not a numbers person. Likewise, that the treasurer didn't um, give them a report they couldn't read, right? Paying attention, right? Be, being able to know or understand uh, what the organization's activities or operations are. Uh, loyalty is putting the interests of the organization before personal or professional interests, right? Sometimes some decisions have to be made where um, maybe there's a little bit of a conflict. A lot of times, if it's a, a real conflict of interest, then a board member needs to take themselves out of the decision. Um, but when acting as a board member and making decisions, those decisions need to be made. Again, think about the slide the governance versus um, support need to be made in a, with the governance hat on, with loyalty to the organization's overall interests. And then obedience is obedience to the law. So complying with the applicable state, federal, and local laws. So what laws do we need to obey, right? Based on the sector that we're in, are we working with children? Are we working um, with the elderly? Are we um, working with building codes? And what, what do we need to follow? What do we need to know about? And do we adhere to those as well as to our own rules and regulations as an organization? So to our own bylaws and to our own mission. And so that's a great conversation um, to have with board members about, you know, do we do, how do we express our care, our loyalty and our obedience to the organization? And, and are we even you know, consciously aware of, of what the regulations are, both state, federal um, bylaws, and then of course, um, as far as maintaining our mission. Questions or um, advice or input about this one?
So the checklist here is just the, um, you know, again, the conversation piece, right? Or the, what do I do as a board member um, to enable to fulfill number nine? And of course, you probably have directors and officers insurance because you are legally and financially liable, liable, but it is good to know, to let board members know that they are legally and financially liable. Number 10 is enhancing the organization's public standing. So it is one of the rules and responsibilities of a board member to um, build the credibility of the organization. And so you want to help create awareness in the community of the organization, educate the community on the organization's mission, um, help get other people engaged in the organization, uh, leverage your networks, right? Um, that's why I remember earlier I said, everybody should have a t-shirt or a hat or a name tag or something um, that says, hey, I am, I'm on this board, I'm part of this organization, helping your organization get noticed. Um, helping um, a lot of nonprofits, there are um, maybe misconceptions out there. Again, Habitat's in the room and I, I, I know and love you all. And so, you know, I know that, that, that the misconception that you give away houses for free uh, is out there amongst the public. And so that's one of the things that your board members help educate the community about is that, we're not out giving houses away for free. We're out um, working with people uh, to make sure that they have the, the financial means uh, to get a better home that's safe and healthy for their family. And so using the, your networks that you have to be able to um, spread the word basically about the organization and its mission. Okay, we're just about to wrap up. Um, so here's our role and responsibility uh, checklist. Oh, it is a, a handout that I gave you. Um, and what I think it would be best if you did is do kind of an individual assessment, or you could even do it as an exercise with your board, um, putting a star next to the thing um, that, yes, I have the skills and I can help with this, um, a question mark next to anything that you're unsure about, and then an exclamation point if anything is no, you feel that you could not assist in this aspect. Um, so that just kind of helps people look through what their roles and responsibilities are and assess where they are. And we don't have time for a group discussion. Um, on our challenges and successes around the checklist because it is 12.55. Um, but let's talk really quickly about consent agenda and then a training that we have coming up next and then we can kind of come off PowerPoint and wrap up. So um, a consent agenda for those organizations that have a lot to cover in a board meeting is um, documentation for the items that are gonna be voted on ahead of time, board members being encouraged to ask their questions prior to the meeting. And if an item needs greater discussion, it can be removed from the consent portion of the agenda and discussed later in the meeting. Um, a board member can request any item be moved to the full agenda and you can vote on a single motion that applies to the entire uh, consent portion of the agenda. And one of your handouts also is about that consent agenda and uh, the how to have productive meetings around that. Questions? So one question we have is, do we offer training on Robert's Rules of Order? Um, nonprofits, I do not personally, but Nonprofits Lead does. 
And uh, Natalie, our nonprofit's lead program director is here on the uh, program. So she'll take note and um, we'll be sure to work that into our board programming. Uh, I think we're gonna, we've are gonna we got a program coming up uh, before, this first half of the year that's gonna cover um, more about productive meetings. Amy, if I may, uh -huh. um, we actually, that is hopefully one of the trainings that we will be doing in March. We're still trying to um, get the speaker for that, but that is definitely on the list. So be watching for that. Super. And I have, let's see, I have one more slide then um, that is continue your training with us, right? So we do have, I refer to our friend, uh, Beth Short, who's in the Ohio Attorney General's Office uh, Charitable Law Division, and uh, she is going to be uh, holding a training for us uh, February 2nd and February 16th. Natalie, could you tell us a little bit about those trainings? Are they the same thing, like these three are uh, repeated, or is it uh, two different parts of a training? Um, when I spoke with Beth, she um, said that she could do the same training on um, the legal do's and don'ts, um, but she said that she has a two part that she could do, and they build on each other, and the second part is more interactive, so I found that to be, um, that might actually be a bit more interesting, and people, folks may learn more with that, so we're going with the two-parter in February. I think that's a great idea. That's a great idea. So February 2nd and 16th, everybody mark your calendars and, and uh, share that information with the rest of your board um, so that you can continue your board training, um, kind of the do's and don'ts and legal duties. Very, very important. Again, board members are legally responsible. In other words, they do have to defend themselves. Um, if somebody were to say that there was wrongdoing. And so hopefully that never happens, but it is, it is good to make sure that you're operating as a board in such a way that you are defended against it. And Amy, one other thing, um, mm -hmm. Amy had suggested that I reach out to Beth and tell her that there will be folks from West Virginia there since she is from the state of Ohio so that she could follow up and do maybe a little bit of research on the West Virginia laws. Um, so I did contact her to let her know. So Great. do not feel discouraged, please attend. She will, be, um, she will be looking up that information as well. Great, great, thank you, Natalie. And I, and I know she, I'm, I'm sure that there are huge discrepancies uh, between the two states, but uh, just for her to do a double check and know where there might be uh, some small differences. I think that would be helpful to the folks that are based in West Virginia that are in the room. All right, well, it's one o'clock and uh, I promise that you didn't have to listen to me any longer after one o'clock. And so if there is, are no other questions or um, no other input, then I will have to sign off and say goodbye. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you Natalie. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, make sure that you're on Natalie's mailing list and that you uh, continue to stay in touch with Nonprofits League.